Hello everyone, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Mandy. I have been doing my PhD more than three years and this is my third Tuesday presentation. Today I'm presenting on behalf of our biophotonic and LIDAR group at Lund University. And uh, before I dig into our research, I would like to share a little bit about myself. I come from Yunnan Kuiming, and uh, it's this beautiful city is known as the city of the spring because we have stabilized temperatures throughout the year. Therefore, we have flower all over the seasons, and we are the host for many migratory birds. And at the same time, we have so many different kind of mushrooms. As you have guessed, um, my parents are Chinese, and I'm a single child. And uh, in my opinion, that's a very unfortunate combination. Because as a single child, your parents really focus on to you about everything, and the Chinese parents really like to make life plan. And uh, in my case, I run into this unfortunate situation where my parents want me to become someone I'm not. For example, my uh, parents could want you to become a lawyer, a doctor, or engineer. But deep inside, I know what I want to become. I want to be a Pokemon master. And you can see the fully supportive supervisor of mine. So, you know, in the Pokemon world, before you start your adventure, you have to have a partner. So my partner in crime is my dog Ace. He's a Kanekoso, two and a half years old. Um, before I would say he's a dog that only judges you, but recently he's a little bit aggressive, so I would say he actually might bite. Anyway, coming back to my research, I'm working with real life Pokemons. So as you can see, uh, the Pokemons are highly inspired by the creatures of our real life. And in my PhD project, I'm mainly working with insects. Um, looking at this picture also makes me feel kind of happy, the fact that Pokemons are now real. Imagine a two meter tall mosquito suck your blood first and give you malaria afterwards. In the Pokemon universe, they have this device called Pokedex, where you can point at one Pokemon at a time, and it will provide you information about which Pokemon it is, what's appearance, and uh, what is the uh, general information about this Pokemon. So for us to start study our real life Pokemons, also have our own Pokedex, and we have our LiDAR. So those are the parameters that we can get from recording a LiDAR signal. Over here is what the typical LiDAR signal looks like. From this time series signal, we're able to get information about the wing sizing, the body sizing, and in this case, it's a polarized LiDAR, therefore we can get the polarization information as well. We know exactly what time and what distance we capture the signal, and then we can resolve what wind frequency corresponding to. And it depends on the configuration of the LiDAR system. You could also switch to do bands or several other bands. You can look into the water pass lens or melanin. But instead of just talking about those parameters, maybe I just show you of how they are used in action. For example, this is one of the ongoing manuscripts we're trying to monitor in the migratory mouth. And the example here, we can show you the distribution of the insect population based on the time of the day or the height. And then we can correlate it with the temperature, therefore we can know what's your preference temperature. The goal of this paper is later to filter out only the migratory moth, and then we can know when exactly are they flying off or landing. Such information will be useful to study the animal behavior or for pest control. The next project I'm showing you are some preliminary data for our famous African trip, which is taken at the beginning of this year. Hampers are the one who mainly made these figures. As I mentioned, LiDAR is capable to identify what time and what location the insect was observed. So in this figure, the insect observations were color-coded based on what time of day they were detected. And uh, from this figure, you can really see there are some different patterns and preference for different canopy height and the time. We're trying to correlate such information with uh, our three-dimensional blendering structures. We're trying to see if it was some vegetations or display of shadows cause certain insect activities at different time of the day. 
In this study, our polarization LIDAR was also used and uh, we're kind of able to identify some of the signals on the right hand side. For example, the top left signal is mostly a dragonfly. It's because it shows such a high copolarized signals and it has a correct wind B frequency. The signal on its right hand side are most likely a mosquito due to its high wind B frequency. And the signal on the bottom right, it could be a lepidoptera. It display a low wind B frequency, just like dragonfly. But however, you can see the degree of polarization is very, very different to the dragonfly signal. So this target that we capture display equally almost strong copolarized and depolarized signal. Therefore, this target must have diffused wind, such as lepidoptera have. Our next problem is there's so much more out there. It's like it's like just in the Pokemon world, it's never finished. There's still more species out there for you to discover. And the same for our LiDAR data. There's so many observations we lack of this really key features to pinpoint down exactly which species or families of insects we're looking at. So with the same logics as in the Pokemon world, the moment your Pokemon Dex doesn't have enough information to tell you what species you're looking at, what do you do? You capture them and you update your database. And uh, sometimes you have to use tools to capture your Pokemon or real life Pokemons. And in this case, we share a very similar strategy. You do sweep netting or pheromone trap or bait trap. Um, pitfall trap doesn't really apply in our case since we were looking at insects that are flying. Uh, but this uh, rocket launcher trap, I'm, I'm really a big fan of it, but unfortunately we couldn't find anyone to support. And uh, you see for our real life Pokemons, we have malice trap, sweep night trap, bait trap, light trap, and uh, pheromone traps. Yeah, it's the same concept. Once you capture the species, we're trying to record as much information of it as possible. So in such a case, we will put sample into the system developed by Hampus called Biospace. It's capable to provide you spatial, spectral, polymetric, and goniometric information of your target. And by recording several samples, we're able to update our database. And then later, we can correlate it with our LiDAR data. However, there's still one problem. What if the species, they just look very similar by their appearance wise, or they had a certain orientation that happened to produce a similar signals? What I'm trying to say is imagine if you have a hoverfly or a wasp and they happen to enter in the light in a really similar manner and since they display really similar color and a similar wind be frequency, in such a case, it becomes very difficult to separate these two apart. What I mean about how the orientation angle would affect the signal is, for example, if you look at this the most difficult question from the Pokemon world, where they were asking which Pokemon this is, the correct answer was a Jigglypuff for you from the top down. As I also show with the example on the right hand side, depends on how the insects fly through your beam, the very same insects based on its orientation will result in different signals that you capture in the LiDAR. And this is where my PhD project comes in. I'm trying to look into what features of the wind that are so species specific that were not mixed with others. So the most common two type of insect winds are shown here, which is the fluffy diffused wind or the clear wind. There are insects out there actually can fly without wind, which is crazy, but that's not in my scope. So let's start with the insect with a clear wing, which is my favorite. As you can see, it's a hover flight. Their wing, maybe not so obvious in the visible, but in this infrared force color image, you can see there's so bubble colors display on the wings. And this is due to a phenomenon called thin film interference. Different thickness of a membrane will enhance or reduce the wavelengths and result in different color patterns. By using a technique called hyperspectral imaging, we're capturing the spectral spectrum reflected from every single part of the wing. And uh, we're able to map out the wing thickness based on the same film interference. And uh, we're able to just use one thickness to representing this wing of this specific thickness and the gender of the insects. But just to know if such technique would actually 
allow us to distinguish between species and sex, we started with a survey study of eight families of different pollinators first. And in the result here, it, it seems quite promising. Different families of insects are distributed at different locations. And here's where we made the decision we would like to into, look into the hoverflies because they have such a thin membrane and that, that result they can produce very nice interference pattern even in the visible range. And they produce such a high modulation signal. That means it's much more promising to detect their signal at a longer range. We have recently submitted a paper, which is in review at the moment, where we scan 600 wings. We're looking to how well we can distinguish hoverfly species and sex based on their wing sickness and the modulation signal. And uh, in the figure on the left is an um, illustration of how well we can distinguish the species and the sex purely based on how strong the signal and the sicknesses are. So it may look a little bit busy. There's a lot of species on top of each other. They're overlapping. But, uh, but still, you can see some of the species are very distinguishable from the rest of them. Figure B is showing different examples of what the wing sickness and the modulation distribution looks like. So for example, the top left wing are really homogenized and thin, and it has a really high modulated signal. And the bottom right wing, where it's really inhomogenized and thick, it has a much more damp and weak reflections. So how well the spectra signal reflected from the wing can help us identify the species and the sex. Here we run a little test with a naive bay classifier. And then when we only have one B frequency of this exact search species of hoverfly, we only have down to 13% of accuracy to identify the correct species. But when slowly adding more features, what you get from the wind signal, such as the wind sickness, wind surface roughness, wind sizing, and how strong this wind signal is, you actually achieve a 91% of accuracy. It is seven times higher when you just only use a wind B frequency alone. So it's an extremely promising method. Then we come to the diffused wind, which is a little bit more difficult because uh, uh, it has this rough surface, you cannot rely on the same film interference. And uh, in this study, we were mainly looking to the diffused brown moth wings. The reason is for most of the butterflies or some special moths, they have this really strong irradiance colors on their body, and it makes them very easy to be distinguished even throughout certain distance. But for the moths and uh, for the especially brown moths, they display very similar colors. And uh, when you look at them from far distance, then it becomes difficult to separate them apart. So in our study, we look into how can we distinguish our brown moths for throughout the long distance. So first, we look into the surface structure of the brown moth, and then we see there's actually a repeat ridge and ribs pattern on the surface of the wing. So the high periodicity display on the surface structure made us think maybe it is affecting how the light was reflecting from the surface in certain ways. So then we look into how the surface structure is reacting with the different wavelengths for light. The picture on the left side are showing the false color and the visible color image of the moth. All the ones on the left side that are diffused are the visible color images and all the image on the display on the right side of mouth are the false color images at the short wave infrared. As you can see, they become even shinier. The explanation we come up of why the mouth wings are become shinier in the longer wavelengths are if you imagine a mouth wing surface as a rough concrete road and now if you have a short wavelength which is a small ping pong ball and you threw it the concrete road and it is much more sensitive to the surface roughness. So therefore the ping pong ball could be bounced to all kinds of directions. But if you increase the wavelengths, which now you have a much bigger ball, like a basketball. So you have a big wavelength, a big basketball, and you're hitting the exact same surface. And it will therefore become less sensitive to the surface. And it will remember its original going direction, resulting in these shiny reflections. So we scan the moth wings from a long range of wavelengths, from 1 micrometer to 2.5 micrometers, trying to see if we can see at which point, at which wavelength, the moth wing becomes shiny. 
we picked a few examples and we were trying to see how well we can correlate this periodicity that we saw from the surface structure to the so-called cutoff wavelengths of the surface roughness. The example here shown including the black and white pepper moth. What comes to our surprise is not only they display very different spectral informations, their surface structures examined by the SEM are also very different. Because pepper moth are the commonly used example for the nature selection, and uh, people always believe these black and white colors on their wing are different degree of melanin. But from our study, we see they actually have different structures as well. Therefore, we got the mini interviews from the nature and the geographic about this. And uh, let's talk about if we can resolve the wind bee frequency and the fringes at the same time. I hope you were paying attention to the Tuesday meeting we had last week presented by Laurel because in his study we have showcased you that we actually captured several live insects wind, wind bee signal together with spectral fringes. So therefore it is doable with our approaches. But of course we just have to improve better with better precisions. So on my journey of my PhD study, I get to visit so many different places, so many different landscapes. I get to be participating in so many experiments and working with different people, all those well experiments. As I said, in the end, the most valuable part throughout your journey is the friendship you made along the way. Thank you very much for your attention. Focus on Thursday.